Uh, my name is Pastor Steve, and uh, we've been here at Hope for about a little over a year now and on staff for about six months. And uh, it's just been a great, great joy uh, to be here with this community so much more than a ministry job. We're just glad to be a part of what God's doing in this community and to be a small part of the word of the Lord sent that is Hope Church. Um, it is a deep, deep honor, and um, I'm excited to share with you this morning. We actually uh, get the privilege to work with uh, the student ministry here, Gen Z, and uh, we believe that Gen Z is actually experiencing the greatest outpouring of the Spirit in human history right now, in this day and hour, and uh, we are just blown away that we get to be a part of that. Amen? All right. Open your Bibles, Matthew 24. And uh, we're going to camp out there for a bit. And I'm going to kind of stay in the, uh, the same place that we've been over the last five, four or five months um, with Pastor Josh just leading the charge, Matthew 24, 25, been in Revelation 1 through 5, uh, talking about the Maranatha cry. And uh, I'm going to stay there and talk today a little bit more on that. Uh, give my perspective on some of this and give you, uh, talk to, to you about an eternal perspective. Uh, Matthew 24, and we'll start in verse 3. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. We've got magical Bibles in the sky for you today. And uh, follow along. We're going to read quite a bit here this morning, and today's going to be more along the lines of a teaching type of uh, message. And uh, we preach sometimes, and sometimes we teach, and I just want to kick off this brand new year with something I feel like the Holy Spirit is really emphasizing, has been, and will continue to emphasize in the days to come. Matthew 24, verse 3. Are you ready? Why don't you turn to your neighbor and just tell him, wait a second, before we do anything, you look really good today. You got to tell him, you look good on a Sunday. Beautiful. All right, here we go. Now, this is, uh, Jesus kind of had three staple teachings in his ministry. One was the Sermon on the Mount, which is the Beatitudes, right? One was the Upper Room Discourse, which John 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Pastor Gary spoke beautifully on that a couple weeks ago. Some people call that the greatest teaching by the greatest teacher. Uh, Holy Spirit is definitely emphasizing that in this hour also. And then right here, Matthew 24, 25, is the Olivet Discourse. Uh, some people call it the end times discourse, and so we're going to look at that today. Matthew 24, verse 3, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, uh, they call it the Olivet Discourse because he's sp speaking on the Mount of Olives, okay? The disciples came to Jesus privately saying, here's their question, incredible, tell us, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Pretty big question, okay? And Jesus answered them. See that nobody leads you astray, verse 5, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, earthquakes in various places, verse 18. You might want to underline these next few words in your Bible, if that's what you do, or take notes. All these are but the beginning of the, what's those next two words? Birth pains. All the women in the room know what that means. Uh, oh, well, all the women that have been pregnant know what that means. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. So then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Okay, right now the nations are canceling Christians on cancel culture, but that will change from ridicule to rage one day. That's what Jesus said. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray, okay? Deception, astray, don't be led astray. It's a common theme through this. Verse 12, because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Come on. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then, everybody say then, Amen. the end will come. Not the end of the world, the end of the age. Okay, verse 15, so when you see the abomination of desolation, well, there's a common phrase we use at the coffee shop on Monday morning. 
The abomination of desolation, what is that? Spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place. Let the reader understand. How many knows when Jesus puts that in there, let the reader understand, we probably ought to go get some understanding. Okay, skipping forward into verse 20, save you some reading. For then, okay, so notice then, then, then. He's giving us some time indicators. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, there never will be. Verse 22, skipping ahead a little. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead many astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand, there's the good leadership of God. For as lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Okay, skipping ahead a little bit more, just saving you some reading. Go home and read the whole thing for yourself. Immediately after the what? Tribulation of those days, so this is going to take place after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. What's that next word? Then, oh, it's about to get good, friends, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he'll send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect, they will gather together the elect from the four winds, that's the four compass directions, from one end of heaven to the other. Amen. Let's pray. We need some help today. Ah, King Jesus, we just welcome you now. Come and pull up a seat at the head of the table. Sit down and talk to us. We, your voice is sweet. Your face is lovely. We're praying now for clarity. Touch our hearts. Let the word of the Lord make entrance today and let us leave built up, strengthened, encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, uh, let's lighten things up a bit. Quick question. Uh, Any of you guys growing up, did you ever have like a meal you didn't want to eat, but you had to eat it because it was what was put in front of you? Anybody? You get what you get, and you don't throw a fit. Come on. (laughs) Shout out to all the parents that still make their kids eat what's in front of them. Come on. I applaud you. Now, uh, my dear mom was a great cook. Um, I honor her. I truly love her. She was, without a doubt, you're going to eat what's put in front of you kind of parent, Uh, which meant I had to eat some things that weren't my favorite growing up. Uh, and one of those things was my mom's infamous Reuben sandwiches. Oh, y'all know what I'm talking about? Wikipedia definition, the North American grilled sandwich composed of gro- corned beef, Swiss cheese, sauerkraut, and Thousand Island dressing. Oh, man. Ooh, there's too much going on in there. Am I right? Can I get a witness in the church? That's the best. Ooh, we're going to pray for you later, man. Too many different flavors. Uh, It's one of those meals I'd rather pass on. Love you, Mom. Uh, I can remember one particular night. uh, It was Reuben night at the Ron's, okay? So I'm doing what I always do on Reuben night. I'm picking up my food. And you know the, the classic move, you try to shuffle the food around on your plate. And if you spread it out enough, it might look like you actually ate it. Never works, Okay. My mom gives me the classic phrase that moms give when the offspring won't eat what's in front of them. They're starving kids in Africa that would give anything to eat that. Classic mom move. Uh, And I'm not sure what came over me in that moment. Was it the Holy Spirit? I don't know. I had had enough, though. And, uh, you know, I came up in my estimation with the greatest comeback of all time for my moms. They're starving kids in Africa that would give anything to eat that. And at the heart level, okay, just I was not trying to be disrespectful. I was just trying to be funny, okay? I get up off my stool. My legs wouldn't even touch the ground. I hop off the stool, plate in hand, okay? I walk over to the desk that to this day is still in the corner of the kitchen of the house I grew up in. Answering machine, phone are still in the exact same place on that desk to this day. I grab one of those manila envelopes <laughs> and a black Sharpie pen, 
and I dump my sandwich into that manila envelope, and I write Africa in big black letters, and I say, well, let's send it to them then. It felt so right. <laughs> it felt so good. Until my mom snatched my scrawny butt up and shoved a bar of soap in my mouth. Should have ate the sandwich. Kids, if you're taking notes, just write this down. Just eat the sandwich. Just eat the sandwich. <laughs> Awkward transition. Uh, I know most of us in this room are not newbies to the Bible. Maybe some are, and that's totally great. But most of us probably aren't. We've been around the block. We've done the Bible drills. Come on, we've, you know, memorized the important verses. We got John 3.16. Shout out to Tim Tebow, who wrote that verse. Just kidding. We got the Romans Road. We got, you know, the Fruit of the Spirit song. We got it all. We can do the books of the Bible. I can start a Bible story. You can finish it. Uh, Card-carrying members of the Jesus Club, congratulations, amazing, needed, foundational. But for some reason, though, when it comes to this subject line, uh, the end of the age, the ages to come, you got Matthew 24, 25, book of Revelation, Daniel, Ezekiel, and other apocalyptic kind of themed books of the Bible, I think a lot of people have a similar relationship as I did to my mom's Reuben. It's a meal I'd rather pass on. Uh, but I feel like I kind of got to eat it because that's what's put in front of me. When you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. There's just a lot going on in there. Can we just be real? Uh, if I'm honest, it seems like the flavors and the themes and the ideas going on in there, they're hard to swallow. Uh, it's hard to get that down, hard to digest. You got seals and trumpets and bowls and plagues and earthquakes and cosmic shakings. You got angels, demons, bloody dragons. You've got men eating books and you got insects eating men. The language is confusing, okay? Is, is, this, is this just a bunch of doomsday noise? Is that what this is? What do we do with that? And where in the world does that fit into my life, 2024, trying to pay my mortgage, build my career, and get my kids to soccer practice on time? Do we even concern ourselves with this? Uh, it, it seems like a complicated dish. Maybe I'll just stick to the Romans road and leave the mysterious numbers and the fantastic beasts and the golden cities to somebody else who's more qualified. Another statement, kind of a big statement, but I, I stand by this. Uh, and I'm not the only one that has said this. I'm not even the original one, but I, I do believe this. I believe the 2020s, this decade, uh, may be one of the most dramatic transitional decades in history. We can all see and probably agree that life on the planet is, has been and is continuing to change, okay? Seemingly at an accelerated rate. As we're moving into election season and all this noise is going to start happening, um, We've all probably come to the conclusion, hopefully all of us have come to the conclusion that things are never going to go back to the way they were before 2020. We're living, the point is, we're living in unusual times It can't be business as usual. And one of the things that you can sense, even here as a community, as Pastor Josh is beautifully leading the charge here, the Holy Spirit is emphasizing uh, a certain theme, many, but here's one. He's trying to get the body of Christ, you and me, to embrace the apostolic gospel paradigm. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, so anybody, one of us in this room could go to any church in this nation and ask anybody at random in that congregation the question, do you want to be blessed? And the resounding answer we would get is, yes. absolutely, because that's the right answer, Okay. We want God's blessing. God wants to give it more than we want to receive it. He's a good father, except the biblical definition, idea for the word blessed, might be a little bit different than ours. Definitely the biblical idea is different than the gospel of the American dream. That has primarily become about God touching with his power our external circumstances. Okay, for example... If my bank account's in the black, then I'm blessed. And if I got two cars in the garage that are paid for, I'm blessed. And if I got 
a gorgeous wife, four-bedroom home, and more followers on Instagram than the Pope, I'm blessed. But when we look at the word blessed in the Bible, it actually has very little to do with our external temporal circumstances. I mean, that's part of it, but it's way down the list. When the Bible uses the word blessed, it's primarily referring to a vibrant spirit or a heart that is alive and tender and positioned to increasingly experience more of the activity of heaven, the the Holy Spirit. Which means I may have a fat bank account, I may have a thriving business, two cars in the garage, a lake house, and win friends and influence people, but if my spirit's dull, I'm not blessed. In the economy of the kingdom, I'm actually bankrupt. The primary emphasis that the apostles emphasized in the epistles was that the decisions we make in this age, they actually have their payoff in the age to come. They have eternal consequences. It's the primary emphasis of the New Testament presentation of the gospel, an eternal, having an eternal perspective, which means we actually think about eternity. And the Holy Spirit is shifting this whole thing back. Look at what Paul has to say, the great apostle, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. This is significant. This is all through the word. If the only benefit of our hope in Christ, get this, is limited to this life only, then we deserve to be pitied more than everybody else. Listen listen to what the the poet C.S. Lewis said. He just kind of echoes the same idea. He said, if you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did the most for this, this present world were precisely those who thought most about the next. It's since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they've become so ineffective in this one. Wow. The unfolding storyline of God to transition the planet to the ages to come. This is the most beautiful, the most glorious the most glorious promise ever made in any story, religion, philosophy, or fairy tale, and it's real, and it's ours, and as we see ourselves in the story, we begin to be motivated by it. Having a biblical perspective of how and why God is moving the storyline of human history forward the way that he is, And how the end times drama unfolds and what it is actually unto is critical for us because it affects how we see our future and how we view our future affects how we live right now. The church fathers and mothers, they believe this, they preach this, and they live this way. Again, Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 5.10, look at what he says. For one day we will all be openly revealed before Christ. On his throne. What a glorious day that'll be. So that each of us will be duly recompensed for our actions done in life, whether good or worthless. Wow. There's actually so much real estate on this throughout Scripture. People that are way smarter than me did the research. They found somewhere between 150 to 160 chapters in the Bible that talk, and, uh, talk about and give details about the end times and the ages to come. 150 to 160. That is a massive amount of information about one subject. In other words, the scriptures actually highlight one generation way more than any other generation. By far, the most described generation in God's plan is the generation when Jesus returns. The exclamation, it's in the repetition, pay attention to this. Get an understanding, lock in. The Bible gives us a framework about this, of understanding, a framework of understanding about how how God's going to transition the planet, the coming kingdom of God, and the implications of all that for me and you. We don't get all the details, obviously. There's mystery in this, but we get enough to where we can build a framework if we're hungry for it and uh, get a broad understanding of some of what life will look like at that time. So my heart today is not 
to be the expert because I am not even close. But I just want to paint a, a, the basic picture for you. Is that, is that okay? And really what I'm hoping is it continues to stir this conversation in this community. I just want to lay out the basics of the storyline, the introductory biblical understanding of our future as it relates to God's plan for all of humanity in this age and then unto the ages to come. So that this picture in your hearts might be filled with rich images and, of, and real anticipation. We cannot under, uh, afford to misunderstand and underestimate our destiny. An anemic perspective of our lives in the ages to come makes us casual with how we spend our lives right now. What we believe about where we're going forms how we live today. This is really important. The writer of Ecclesiastes actually said this. It's so beautiful. He said, God has written eternity into the hearts of men. The hope of the resurrection that is ours through the sacrifice of Jesus, it's actually meant to be the fuel that sustains our journey here. Again, the Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 5. You might read that whole chapter. It's so good. Look at what he said. We crave for the mortal to be swallowed up by eternity. When's the last time that you craved for that? The apostles did. And this is no empty hope, for God himself is the one who has prepared for us this wonderful destiny. Look what he says at the end. That's why we're always full of courage. Matthew 24, famous end times chapter taught uh, by Jesus, and we really want this chapter to inform the rest of the information. This is Jesus' famous end times chapter. Now, when we say that phrase, end times, what we're talking about is the season leading up to what the Bible calls the end of this age and the beginning of the age to come. You guys follow me or is this too much for Sunday morning? Again, notice we're not talking about the end of the world. We're talking about the end of the age. There's a big difference. Jesus' disciples come to him and they say, Jesus, give, tell us what it's going to look like. What's the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus proceeds, the remaining of chapter 24, chapter 25, same conversation, different chapters, same conversation. He gives them four time frames that will unfold in the generation of the Lord's return. With the culmination of these four time frames being the end of natural human history and the beginning of a brand new age. Okay? So I want to give you those four time frames today. Uh, that Jesus lays out, Matthew 24, 25. Don't take my word for this. Go home and look at this information for yourself, okay? And then we'll just hit on a couple of these time frames. So here's the first four time frames. Number one, the beginning of birth pains. Number two, man, we got 20 minutes. The tribulation. Number three, the second coming of Christ. Number four, the age to come. You guys ready? Buckle your seatbelts. We're gonna go quick. We gotta go fast. Number one, the beginning of birth pains. Matthew 24, verse three. Um, he gives this whole list, wars, rumors of wars, nation against nation, people against people, pestilence, all these things. And then he says, all these are the beginning of the birth pains, okay? It's a metaphor. Uh, they use the metaphor of birthing a child repeatedly in the scripture to interpret the end times. All the mothers in the room can relate to that language, okay? The closer you get to giving birth, the labor pressures get more intense, and the reprieves get shorter in between, okay? The contractions start off slow and infrequent, but gradually increase in intensity and frequency and consistency. And when you see that happening, you're alerted, mom, that something brand new is on its way. Come on. The pressure and the pain are pointing towards something indescribably beautiful, the birth of something brand new. Jesus, what will be the signs of the time and your coming, the end of the age? It'll be like birth pains. The contractions will start off slow and infrequent, but gradually increase in intensity, consistency, and frequency. And when you see that happening, beloved, you can be alerted to the reality that something brand new is about to come. 
The birth of something brand new is on the way. So what is that new thing on the way? Glad you asked. Revelation chapter 21. Then I saw, John said, a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, doing what? Coming down out of heaven from God. We sang it today. Prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They'll be his people. God will be their God. He'll wipe away tears from their eyes. Death won't be anymore. No mourning, no crying, no pain. Former things passed away. Verse 5. Then the one who sat on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. It's the pinnacle, man. The pinnacle of the entire Bible takes place with the voice of the one seated on the throne declaring, I am making all things new. Notice that the one on the throne did not say, I will do it. He said, I am doing it. In other words, this reality is actually unfolding. We are swept up, beloved, in an unfolding drama. It's unfolding right now before our eyes. It's actually breaking in upon us right now in live time. Peterson said this, eternal life is not the life we get after death. It's the life we get from God right now. It's not something I wait for. It's something we participate in. It's not a distant promise. It's a present history. The writer of Hebrews said it like this, just a little while longer and he who is coming will come. My God, that's good. Notice that God, another thing to know, God didn't say I'm going to make all new things. He said I'm going to make all things new. There's going to be a new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem in the age to come. Remade, restored, perfect resurrection, beauty, and glory, but it's still heaven, earth, and Jerusalem. In other words, the primary message here is not annihilation, it's redemption. It's the heart of our God. In other words, he's not coming back to destroy the planet. He's coming back to restore it in full resurrection potential. Come on, it's good news. It's the hope of our salvation. Yeah, there's some passages in there that may make Kirk Cameron, you know, run on his best day. But we, and we don't ignore that, but the ultimate implications is the earth is restored and renewed, not vaporized like Asgard, like the Death Star. <laughs> Jesus goes on, Matthew 24, 12 trends uh, or signs to indicate, characterize the generation of the Lord's return. These are time indicators that we can use, that when we see them in the earth being played out all together on a global level in increasingly consistent ways and growing in intensity, you and me can have an understanding. Aren't you thankful that we can understand that birth pains have begun, that something brand new is about ready to be birthed, there's an acceleration of God's plan that's upon us, and we can align our hearts in that moment to Jesus' leadership. It's the goodness of God to give us a heads up on this so that me and you can make adjustments little by little. And I actually feel like that's what this whole conversation has been about. He's giving space to the body of Christ to begin to make adjustments because you know as well as I do, we can't make big heart adjustments in a minute. It would overwhelm us. It takes time to walk these things out. To use the analogy, we're not even gonna get through any of this to use the analogy that I think really kind of brings us home, okay? It's, it's, it's like the body of Christ, we're swimming against like a one mile an hour current. Any swimmers in here? Yeah, come on. You know, we're talking about what? That, that resistance coming against the messaging of Jesus, biblical values, absolutes, you know, all of that. It's like a one mile an hour current right now. Uh, it's coming against us. And it takes effort. Swimmers know it takes effort to swim against a one mile an hour current. And it's more difficult to stay the course for the long haul. Okay? But here's the deal. Not to scare you, but just to, so we're alerted. The deal is that it's going to increase to two miles an hour one day. It's, it, it's, in other words, it's not going to go back to zero. Okay? 
and then it's going to go to two, and then three, and then one, one day it'll be five miles an hour. It's going to be difficult to thrive when the current increases if we're not intentional to go deep in God's presence, God's word, the fellowship of the burning heart community with people right now. We really don't want to take this one mile an hour season for granted and treat it casually. We're living in unusual times. It can't be business as usual. I just want to encourage you, jump in on this fast. If you've never done it, if you were planning to just shove it off this year, man, let's go deep together so that little by little we can grow into this end time conversation, this, uh, this end time community together and little by little align ourselves with Jesus' leadership. We don't do this as silos. We do this together. We lean into the centerpiece of universal worship, the Lamb in the midst of the throne, so that in the day of trouble, when anxiety is increasing all around us and if fear doesn't overwhelm us, we're safe in him. We understand. We understand the pressure. It's pointing towards something gloriously wonderful. God's transitioning the planet. He's making all things new. It's not the time to be fearful. It's not the time to be casual. Listen, it's time to get oil. It's time to bow down and kiss the sun. Psalms 2. It's time to be watchful and sober. Get in the prayer room this year. Get in the prayer room. It's time to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. These birth pains, they increase in frequency and intensity and eventually they'll move the planet into the second time frame Jesus talks about, Matthew 24, the tribulation. Okay, I'm not going to get into that. I've got a bunch here, but we're not going to do that because we don't have time. Uh, we get through the seven years of tribulation broken up into two, three and a half year periods of time. We got, there's so much in here. It's again, the basic overview. We know how the tribulation, we don't know when the tribulation begins. We do know how it begins with the abomination of desolation. We're not going to go there. We could, but we're not which will transition. We know how the tribulation begins, but beloved, we also know how it ends. The third time frame, the second coming of Christ. Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation of those days, can you see the timeline he's giving us? The sun will be darkened, the moon will give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the palms will shake, heaven will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Oh, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see. Everybody say, they will see. They'll see the Son of Man. That's not a metaphor. That's literal. They'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, the same clouds you're, you could see outside when you look outside today, if there's clouds. <laughs> They're going to see him coming. He's going to send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. Okay, he also refers to that in Revelation, seven trumpets connected to seven judgment events. And then they will gather, the angels will gather his elect, that's you and me, from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, if you're like me, I guess I sort of assumed at the second coming of Jesus, it was going to be some like thousand foot tall Jesus somehow snapping his magical fingers, bada bing, bada boom, he's Italian, uh, you know, and poof instantaneously, time stops, natural processes stop, in, out, quick, easy, over, and then I guess heaven comes next, whatever that means, I guess the details are a little fuzzy, okay? So can I, I just want to give you just basic clarity. We've got 14 minutes. Basic clarity and a vision of this glorious, of this glory of all glories in the transition in the story. How many know we need to view the Bible? It's not, it's, we don't approach this as a devotional, although that is good. We, we approach it like an unfolding drama. We begin to see ourselves in the story. The early church had a vision for this, man. They had a vision for this. They, the early church used the details of this second coming event as fuel to sustain their journey. And we should too. 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul says this, for, I, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, foundational, we all believe it, we also believe that God will bring with Jesus those who died while believing in him. Talking about the resurrection. This is the word of the Lord, we who are alive in him and remain, everybody say, until the Lord appears. So that means there are going to be, some of us remain 
until the Lord appears. We'll by no means have an advantage over those who have already died, for both will rise together. For the Lord himself will appear with the declaration of victory. Oh, come on. What kind of declaration is that going to be? He's actually declaring it right now. Remember, he's not coming. He, he's, it's not he will come. It is he is coming. He's actually making that declaration right now. The declaration of victory, the shout of the archangel, and the trumpet blast of God. There's that trumpet thing again, Revelation. He will descend from the heavenly realm. Jesus will descend from the heavenly realm and command those who are dead in Christ to rise first. Then we who are alive will join them, transported together where? In the clouds to have an encounter with the Lord where? In the air. And we will be joined forever with the Lord. So encourage one another with these words. When's the last time you sat down for coffee with a brother who was discouraged and actually used these words to encourage them? <laughs> Jesus and Paul are teaching the same message, right? Painting the same picture here. So can I just encourage you, beautiful body of Christ going into 24, this is our future. This is our future. This is our story. This is our certain destiny through the blood, body, and resurrection of Jesus. And when we see these things begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your heads, your redemption draws nigh. There's coming a day when an event is going to take place in the sky. It's called the sign of the Son of Man, where the burning Jewish man named Jesus in a resurrected body, is going to return to this planet. Remember in Acts 1, the disciples are looking at Jesus float away like a helium-filled balloon, and he disappears. Two angels show up and go, why are you looking up into heaven? This same Jesus that you just saw go will come back just like he left. Zechariah 14, it says that when he does this on that day, he's coming with all the saints and all the holy angels. The grandstands of heaven one day will be emptied and on display in this planet for every eye to see. At the same time that this happens, that Jesus is descending from the heavenly realm into the earthly realm, every saint that has lived for God from the beginning of creation until that time that has died is going to come out of their graves and join this resurrected Jewish man named Jesus in the sky, and those saints will instantly receive a glorified body. This is crazy, man. <laughs> this is wild. This is going on in the sky, okay? The same sky that you can see with your own two eyes if you'll go outside and look up. This is not some side item <laughs> where there's, out of nowhere, there's a bunch of piles of clothes left everywhere, and the world wonders, where did everybody go? This is not left behind, okay? The world is going to see this happen right in front of their eyes. It will be on display in the sky for all to see. Revelation 1, for behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. He is coming. Notice again, it's not he will come, he is coming. This is not some distant promise. It's a present history. It's upon us, beloved. It's unfolding in our time. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It gets better. We've got nine minutes. Let's fill these up. <laughs> Immediately after the dead in Christ have been resurrected first, anybody left alive on the planet that has stood with Jesus through the great tribulation who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb will be caught up transported up, gathered together in the sky with this resurrected Jewish holy man, all the angels, all the resurrected saints, and they too will get a glorified resurrected body. This is our story, friends. There is a day of resurrection glory that is soon coming to the planet when we all are going to be gathered together in the sky to meet the Lord. Our king and his kingdom have come on earth as it is in heaven. We sang it today. A brand new age has begun. The kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ, and he will reign forever. Do we understand our future, our destiny? 
Man, I think a lot of people want to go to heaven like we want, I want to go to Florida. It's like the weather's better and the people will be nice. I mean, no, there's not even a hint of escapism in the biblical narrative. Not even a hint, okay? We aren't going to heaven somewhere, newsflash. It's coming down to us, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. In other words, we're not leaving this earth and going to some ethereal heaven somewhere, somewhere else. Behold, I am making all things new. Jesus is coming back the second time as a man of war to destroy the Antichrist and his armies, <laughs> right? Riding on a white horse, fire in his eyes, sword in his hand, a white garment dipped in blood, Revelation 19. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Death will be no more. Former things passed away. He's coming back to the planet to swallow up death forever. Again, it's all through the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, Apostle Paul. Listen, I'll tell you a divine mystery. Lean in. I want to share something special. Not all of us will die, but all of us will be transformed. It will happen in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, for when the, what's that next word? Last trumpet, that's the seventh trumpet in Revelation, which at the seventh trumpet there's a declaration, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. It's the second coming. So when at the last trumpet is sounded, the dead will come back to life, the resurrection, We will be indestructible and we will all be transformed for we will discard our mortal clothes and slip into a body that's imperishable. Mm. What is mortal now will be exchanged for immortality and when that which is mortal puts on immortality and what now decays is exchanged for what will never decay, then the scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up by a triumphant victory. So death, where is your victory? Tell me death, where is your sting? The second coming, it starts in the sky, but the procession doesn't end in the sky. It ends on the literal ground. The same earth you can feel in between your toes if you go outside and take your shoes off. Jesus will touch down in Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14, and he's touching down first for a military conflict between Jesus and and his army of resurrected saints and angels and the Antichrist and his army that has surrounded Jerusalem. This will be the most lopsided battle in human history. It will be like a hot knife through butter, okay? It will be 100% casualty for the Antichrist and his army. Well, Jesus and his army aren't even out of breath. I could do this all day. Thessalonians says it like this, the Lord will destroy the Antichrist and his army with the breath of his mouth and bring them to nothing by the appearance of his coming. (laughs) Oh, the point is this, the victory is sure. Friends, our victory is sure. Our destiny is sealed up in this man with fire in his eyes. The one who's coming riding on a white horse. The armies of heaven dressed in white behind him. Listen to me carefully. The outcome cannot be anything but this. Let that sink in. What will it be like to no longer be assaulted? No more mental, emotional assault. No, free, free from accusation. What will it be like to look in the mirror and not hear the voice of accusation coming against you? To be completely free of all temptation, all sabotage of your character, not because we're successfully resisting it in a moment of great resolve. No, 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 no. It's not it. It's because it no longer exists anywhere on the planet. This is our future. With the breath of his mouth, He'll bring evil to nothing by the appearance of his coming. We enter into the fourth time frame, and we we don't have any time here, but Matthew 25. When the Son of Man appears in his majestic glory, with all his angels by his side, he'll take his seat on his throne of splendor. And so will begin a thousand, the first thousand years of eternity. 
the millennial kingdom, Jesus, he'll, he'll set up his throne in Jerusalem and he'll begin to govern the nations from his throne. And the glory of the Lord will continue to cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. Under Jesus' perfect leadership, you think about that. We're going to see this. We'll be there. Under his leadership, the planet, this planet, begin to experience complete healing and renewal in every sphere of society. Thousand years of unprecedented blessing, righteousness will fill the whole earth. You feel it? It's even spreading right now. I know it looks dark, but it's spreading right now. A new expression of the kingdom of God <laughs> manifest in every sphere of society. It's going to restore the animal life, the agricultural life back to its resurrection potential. It's the Garden of Eden reality, unlike it's just fantastic. Fantastic. And you and I, me and you, will be there. Ruling and reigning over the nations with Jesus, our bridegroom God. Can I read one more scripture? You guys can stand. <sighs> just close your eyes and just let let these words wash you here just real quick because I think I think what the Lord is doing in this hour is he's, he's making us aware of some of, of an external reality going on in all of creation but also an internal reality they, did you know there's something internal going there's a groan inside of you right now and what it's for listen said, I'm convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that's about to be revealed within us. The entire universe is standing on its tiptoes. Oh, can you feel it? It's yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. For against its will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin. But now, everybody say now, with eager expectation, all creation longs for freedom from its slavery to decay and to experience with us the glorious freedom coming to God's children. To, to this day we are aware of the universal agony God would you make us aware Whew. Holy Spirit God make us aware of the universal agony groaning of creation as it were in the contractions of labor for childbirth verse 23 and it's not just creation we who have already experienced the first fruits of the spirit salvation also inwardly groan as we passionately long to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters including our physical bodies being transformed verse 24 for this is the hope of salvation just put your hands over your heart this whole thing it's this Maranatha cry come Lord would you just open your mouth just right where you are and this doesn't have to be pretty would you just ask God to make you more aware awaken the groan in your beloved bride the spirit and the bride say come oh God we want to see the city of the great king. We want to see the temple human hands have not built. 
we want to see the man that will restore all things. Can we together, can we lift our voice as we just pray that Revelation 22 prayer, come Lord. Come on, beloved, lift up your voice. Come Lord. We long for your presence, the day of your appearing. (laughs) Oh, stir it up, spirit of truth, come. Awaken your bride unto this glory of all glories. Let us be encouraged by it. Let us be built up. Oh God, we pray. Unite us together as one, just as you and the Father are one. Strengthen this community. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. If you sense his nearness, would you just put your hands up one more second? Thank you, Jesus. Your seat is always at the head of the table. Yeah, your seat is always at the head of the table. We love your word. We love what you're doing in the earth. this room that you know for whatever reason the demands of 23 traumas tragedies whatever you got disconnected somewhere along the way from the source of life from the one whose life gives light to all mankind you got disconnected and you know what he's not mad he's he's the one who sees us running afar off and he comes with a ring and a rope you're here today and you feel that disconnect today is the day of salvation you you must repent turn back if that's you today we want to join you as a family surround you these moments are so much bigger than a hand raised and a prayer prayed it's what God's really after is the yes in your heart that that makes that hand go up if you're here today and there is that disconnect you feel it you feel it know it. Nobody has to convince you. You know it's there. You want to repent and turn back today to the way of Jesus, the person, the Son of the Most High. Would you just lift your hand up where you are? Yeah, I got you, man. I got you, sis. I got you, guys. I got you. Are there others today? I got you, man. I got you. you know, can we can we do this? Can we just we won't drag this out? We'll dismiss. But can we have some uh, ministry team just kind of gather over here on the right side? Just of just a few, maybe staff. I just declare over those of you that raised your hand. There is no more accusing voice of condemnation for those who have been joined in life union with Jesus, the anointed one. Shame has to go. Brand new day for you. So if you raised your hand, you know, it's like, 
here's the deal. Uh, there's got to be a little bit of accountability, like a next step on this. And we want to do that with you. We really do. It's a loving, caring community, church, pastors, spiritual leaders here. So if that's you and you raised your hand, I want to ask you to do one more thing. So we dismiss. Would you just make your way down here? So the trusted group of people, I want to lead you in a prayer and come around you, maybe point you in the direction of another step that you can take. This is the first step of many, 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 many steps that you'll take, not of salvation, but of continuing your walk with the Lord. So God, thanks so much for this time. You always have the honored seat at the head of the table. Bless this people as we go into a new year. In Jesus' name, amen. If you raised your hand, I want to encourage you, don't slip out. Don't do it. Don't talk yourself out of this. Come up front here. If the rest of us, if we could just kind of do our fellowship in the lobby, it'd be great today. We love you so much.